Fiona Hill, a distinguished Russia expert, has recently argued that the West's confrontation with Russia over Ukraine has already brought us into World War III. That is dangerous hyperbole. What made the first two world wars so devastating was that the major powers of the day got into direct and protracted military conflict with one another. We are not in that kind of battle today. And with nuclear weapons, one shudders to even think about the trajectory of a great power war. But she's right in one sense. The West is collectively waging economic war on Russia on a scale that would have been unimaginable just a year ago. The consequences of that are likely to be with us for decades. This new Cold War marks the end of the era of globalization and integration that has shaped the international system since 1989. We're now living in a new world of great power competition, economic nationalism, and technological decoupling. The risks of this new war might not be nuclear, but they are sky high, especially for the United States. The sanctions against Russia have been more far-reaching than anyone had previously predicted. They have included extraordinary measures, such as freezing Russia's central bank reserves and cutting banks off from SWIFT, the financial messaging system that is a vital part of the global economic infrastructure. They've targeted the key vulnerabilities of countries in a world of globalized supply chains by denying Russia access to advanced technology. The author Chris Miller writes that among the worst affected sectors have been cars, trucks, locomotives, and fiber optic cables, each of which has seen production fall by over half. Russia's imports have also collapsed. Now, as The Economist points out, when you look at some of Russia's broad economic indicators, they're holding up better than expected. The IMF had predicted that its economy would contract by about 8.5 percent this year. It has since revised its forecast to only 3.4 percent. Inflation spiked initially, but is easing now. The reasons are varied. Russia is actually not that globalized of an economy, and the state has a large footprint within it, both of which cushion the population from external blows. But the biggest explanation by far is that Russia is a resource economy, a country whose wealth heavily depends on its export of oil, gas, nickel, aluminum, and other such commodities. And those have been largely shielded from sanctions because the West realizes that the world relies on these inputs and banning them would cause as much pain to consumers as to Russia, the producer. Washington's sanctions have been well-planned and well-executed, with one exception, energy. If the goal is to reduce Moscow's oil revenues, the sensible strategy, assuming you can't cut off all Russian oil supplies, would be to allow petroleum to flow unrestricted while working on a long-term plan to reduce Western dependence on Russian energy. That way, for now, supply would stay plentiful, which means prices would stay low. Instead, Western countries announced an embargo on Russian oil. The price cap on Russian oil, now proposed, is an effort to correct these mistakes and essentially negate the effect of the oil embargo. So were the efforts to get Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states to pump more oil, which have failed. The Saudis miscalculated how badly their decision would go down in Washington, and it will cause a rupture in relations between the two countries. But the larger problem is the West's incoherent energy strategy. It has underinvested in the energy it actually uses today, which is fossil fuels, based on magical thinking about the energy of tomorrow, renewables, which really will come the day after tomorrow. The greatest danger to the United States is that much of this economic war is being waged by America alone, using the unique status of the dollar as its weapon. Because countries need to use the one truly global currency, the threat to cut them off from it allows for extensive sanctions that can touch on goods and services that are not even produced in America. The dollar hit a two-decade high last month because of the lack of alternatives to it. But at the same time, many major countries, from India to Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Turkey, Indonesia, and of course, China, are searching for ways to shake off the hold of U.S. currency and escape the long reach of Washington's economic power. As I've suggested before, President Biden needs to make a speech in which he explains that it is only because of the unprecedented nature of Russia's challenge, 
to the rules-based international order that Washington is wielding these weapons, and that they will never be used in normal circumstances or for purely parochial interests. Wherever possible, Biden should be trying to keep the widest number of countries on board. Otherwise, even if America were to win this struggle with Russia, future historians might remember this as the moment when countries around the world began to reduce their dependence on America, and when Washington lost what a French president once called the exorbitant privilege of holding the world's reserve currency. Go to CNN.com slash Farid for a link to my Washington Post column, and let's get started.